He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Please be seated. Even when our eyes are open, we don't see everything. Even when we are listening, we don't hear everything. We're not aware of what is being built up around us. And because we're familiar with the sight, we're not always aware of what is fading around us. We may not be aware of this great day. Maybe we still bask in the victory parade that Jesus had on Thursday. Or maybe already our sights are looking forward to the promise of the Father that will be fulfilled on Pentecost. As Jesus told the disciples, stay in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. But today is the 43rd day after Easter. We add this week to it and it brings us to Pentecost. A Jewish festival when believers from all over the world would be in Jerusalem. When the Spirit would be poured out on the disciples and they would speak in tongues to all the people that were there. An amazing Spirit-filled event. But today... We hear what the disciples do in order for God to do what he does. It was a number of years ago, and I recall mentioning it in a sermon, a strange thing that the Lord does. And it's this, that the Lord will always have his twelve. If you were to ask, what is God's business, you could say he's in the twelving business. When we heard the Acts reading today, you might notice that the twelve disciples had a problem. They weren't twelve, they were eleven. God will always have his twelve. The twelve sons of Jacob the twelve disciples, looking into the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the twenty-four who are seated around the throne, the completion of the Old Testament, the completion of the New Testament, all centered around God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God will always have his twelve. Now we can count the number of people here and say, well, it's a little bit more than twelve but God will always have his church, his people. So the 11 said, we've got to make 12 again. And they did it in an extremely holy, pious way, right? Casting lots. That's a familiar thing in biblical literature. People are casting lots all the time to settle disputes and arguments to determine who was it, to determine who got what. Now, we don't exactly know what it means to cast lots, but the modern equivalent you and I can think of is drawing straws, flipping a coin, rolling dice. Extremely holy, very pious, right? But instead of focusing on the method of choosing, let's focus on the choosing and what Peter had to say. 
You, Lord, know the hearts of all. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take place in ministry. So Matthias was the lucky one. The lot fell on him. Sounds kind of physical. Almost painful even. Ouch, the lot fell on me. And when you think of what happened to the apostles in their ministry, maybe at times they did say, ouch, when they were beheaded, crucified, crucified upside down, flayed alive. The lot fell on Matthias. So God chose him. Peter knew that the choosing was not necessarily the group's doing, but was God's. And God was bringing Matthias into God's ministry. When Jesus sent out the disciples on that first Easter evening, he breathed on them and gave them the Holy Spirit and sent them out to forgive the sins of those who repent and to withhold the sins of those who do not. To preach repentance and forgiveness in Jesus' name. That was the ministry. And we see evidence of that ministry. Maybe not so much from Matthias's work, we don't know where he went, what he did. We don't know if anything is left of his ministry. But as God's people continue to gather in the Lord's house, that's a good indication that those who took their place in the ministry used it as a service. That's what a ministry is. It's a service. Or at least it's supposed to be. Do you ever get frustrated with administers and administrators? Their job is to serve. They serve up red tape. And they serve up all kinds of things. Not always helpful. What else do we know about service? Do you ever leave someone a bad review on Yelp? Maybe you received a bad review. Or you work in retail and someone says, I'd like to speak to the manager. And you're like, oh, nuts. <laughs> service. That's what ministry is supposed to be about. But Jesus left the disciples with a good word. He said, I have given them your word. And Jesus goes on to say, they are not of the world as I am not of the world. And the world will hate them because the world has hated me. And as Jesus prayed in the upper room, he said something very, very loving and kind. Father, I am not praying that you take them out of the world. I am not praying that you spare them from hardship and persecution and failure. But I am praying that you keep them, that you love them, that you go with them. Jesus was not of the world. His disciples were not of the world. But we know that Jesus had a ministry. He had service. And he left his church to do that ministry. We, the branches, are connected to Jesus the vine. We heard that a few weeks ago. And last week we celebrated the fact that connected to Christ the vine... We bear fruit. Our ways are the ways of the word. 
not the ways of the world. Even though the ways of the world can be very appealing, alluring, deceptive. Focusing on progress and numbers and making sure the numbers that are up are up and the numbers that should be down are down. But Jesus was not of the world and neither is his church. But ministry becomes really hard because Satan wants us to follow the ways of the world. To focus on all those things that look good. To focus on ourselves. Sometimes in the ministry of the church, the ministry becomes about the minister. And he allows that to happen. My idea will carry the day. Nothing is going to happen unless I don't do it. So I better do it. They need me. They will collapse without me. That's Satan encouraging us with his initial lie to Eve. You can become like God. When the ministry, when the service becomes all about the individual... That's following the ways of the world. And the ways of the world encourage us to abandon God's ministry, God's service. We use not the word that has been given to us, but words we hear so frequently. We don't speak words of forgiveness and compassion and kindness and grace but instead speak words of I'll say accountability it's not that we merely hope for three strikes before you're out but we're afraid of one strike we're afraid of Falling short and those failures and the pressure we put upon ourselves, the ways of the world, to make sure you bring about success. Not the way of the word. The word of Christ as our foundation. The way of Christ bringing himself to us. That's part of the ascension message. Christ ascends to heaven to bring heaven close to us. To have us keep our eyes on our place in God's church. Our sinful nature encourages us to Ignore the word and focus on the world. We focus so much on the things we can't do. We focus on the things others can't do. A few weeks ago I learned of a word called wrong spotting. And it happens in relationships. Any kind of relationship. When we deal with somebody, we're listening, but we're listening for what is wrong. In their conversations, in their words, we're trying to spot what is wrong. And so when we find out what is wrong, we can quickly dismiss them, move away from them, judge them. I think our sinful nature. Wrong spots ourselves. They chose Matthias to be a part of the ministry. He must have had something going for him. 
He was a witness from John's baptism to the resurrection. But we look at ourselves. For God's word reveals who we are. And we wonder how can we have a place in the ministry. On Thursday night I shared a quote from Martin Luther. And maybe I'll balance things out by encouraging us to focus on the words of Groucho Marx a little bit. He says, I wouldn't want to belong to any club that would have me as a member. Right? What ministry am I qualified for? What good can I do in God's kingdom? If the church allows us inside her doors... They need a better vetting process. But the ways of the world are not the way of the word, our Lord Jesus. The doors are opened. Christ is the world's redeemer. The lover of the pure. Jesus ascended the cross to undo what had been done, to make things right, to give us a place in the ministry, you will really find nothing about what Matthias had done. And that's not the focus. God chose him and put him to work. God continues to choose us in the waters of holy baptism. God strengthens us for our service when the meal is set before us. Faith is strengthened. Faith is renewed. Life is renewed. Life is renewed. And that's the last thing I'll say about our ministry. John, who wrote the gospel lesson, also wrote our epistle reading for today. And John wrote this for the church, for us. Whoever has the Son has life. When Jesus prayed, I have given them your word, he was saying, I have given them myself. The word that we have in bound volumes. The word that's on our phone. The word that's in our ears. We are given Jesus. Whoever has Jesus has life. We could use life. Especially when we take our place in the ministry. When with gratitude we give of ourselves when we produce fruit, not for our own sake, but for the sake of others, people we may not ever meet, but we take our place in the ministry because God has given that to us. He has opened the doors, brought us in, and given us a place in the ministry. So take it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.